Hello, folks. Welcome to another edition, a special edition of Inside the Marble Palace, Post Media's look at Saskatchewan politics, usually weekly, but when something big happens, it happens. So we talk about it. I'm Murray Mandrick, political columnist for the Regina Leader Post. With me is almost always, and always, uh, Zach uh, Becerac, Becerac. Oh, I'll never get it right. <laughs> of the Saskatoon Star Phoenix and Jeremy uh, Symes of the Regional Leader Post, uh, both covering politics at various times, either permanently or uh, less permanently. Let's start with you, Zach, because uh, you're in the permanent uh, uh, situation with uh, with not only just COVID, but the, the whole uh, announcement related to Ryan Miley today and his declaration of uh, that he is not running. What was said at the press conference? Because a lot of us don't know up to and including me who who wasn't there. Right, Murray. So this was sort of, to some people, I think, was a sudden announcement. And to others, was something that was brewing for some time. Ryan Miley announced this morning that he will be stepping down as leader of the Saskatchewan NDP and that he has called a leadership race. Now, important note, he said that he will stay on as leader until a new leader is selected, making him sort of the de facto interim leader in the time being. As for reasons given, uh, Ryan Miley said that he essentially believes that it's time for a fresh voice in the party as they look to move beyond COVID-19. Um, I thought this was very interesting. He kind of tried to cast his own resignation as a victory in a way. He says, we're moving to a new phase of the pandemic. We need a fresh voice to kind of articulate our hopes for what comes after that pandemic. And that he, as a physician and as the leader of the NDP during the pandemic, has become too tied to and too associated to rhetoric around COVID-19. He's been a very consistent voice for stronger public health measures, for regulations to keep the virus in check compared to government's more libertarian uh, approach, which has been criticized for some as being as being reckless. What government says, what Scott Moe said today when asked for a reaction, is that Ryan Miley is falling on the sword of his caucus, that their policies haven't worked during the pandemic, they haven't been popular, um, he pointed to the recent upset in the Athabasca constituency where a SAS party candidate, Jim LeMegg, became the first SAS party candidate to take that riding, taking an NDP stronghold from them, and said, look, this is an indictment of the NDP as a whole and, and of their policies during the pandemic. So two different stories from two different parties, both trying to position this as a major win for themselves and as a step forward. What was the tone and mood? Uh, people are always interested in uh, trying to read body language whatever they can that's not spoken verbally what did you sense in terms of um, of what ryan miley was telling us in maybe uh, forms other than words and what else struck you in terms of what he did say that you found particularly interesting you know i'm so glad you asked me that question because it was sort of the opposite of what you might expect ryan miley appeared to be pretty calm pretty at peace he was frank about some things that he felt he could have done better. He was frank that you know, he said he didn't have any regrets about advocating for public health measures so strong, but he kind of acknowledged, he's like, basically said, look, we, we need someone with fresh ideas and a fresh voice to lead the party forward to the next phase. He pledged to get behind that person, whoever they, they elect. Um, he said that for now, he will continue representing his constituency, Saskatoon Me Wasson, but that he basically wants to do whatever he can to help out the new leader and not bring any of his baggage into it. The way he said it, actually, is that he not, he's not going to get the goal, but he wants to be providing the assist. And whether it was a front or not, the mood among him and his staff at the press conference, I thought was actually fairly jovial, fairly friendly. Right? They didn't seem to be in a state of depression or disarray. They seemed fairly calm. They, they seemed fairly organized. I didn't get the sense that this was a, a total capitulation um, in, in a way. It seemed like something that was, that was sort of just happening. And it, it almost lacked that kind of gravitas that you kind of thought was coming there. Uh, but there was actually kind of a contrast for me when you went to the press conference with Scott Moe, where in his opening remarks, he actually did not mention Ryan Miley by name at all which was kind of curious because he's holding this press conference like an hour after Miley makes his official announcement. And he did his usual thing where he rallied against the federal government, talked about them invoking the Emergencies Act, which he is strongly in opposition to, um, and just sort of went on a tangent about that. And throughout the press conference, he, he kind of was on the defensive about questions about COVID-19, about his rhetoric, which some charges divisive, even as he fired shots back at the NDP. And you got the sense that Mo was actually in a worse mood than Miley, even though to an observer, Mo has just lost his his major political rival on the other side of the aisle. 
So one really kind of wonders, like, you know, which party is in a position of strength here and, and why is it was, was uh, Miley was so calm? Is it just that he's ready to move on from this job and, and give this job to somebody else? Uh, I, I, I really would be fascinated to be a fly on the wall at either caucus meeting right now. I, I, I'm interested in and I think we're going to circle back to that because uh, in some ways, I guess, losing Ryan Miley that you've had success against might be a sad day for Sask, uh, Sask uh, Party and Scott Moe because it's quite possible that uh, the next person that is going to have more success, but they seem to be in a really solid position. So I guess into that, but we'll circle back to that and just ask Zach about one other thing that you, or, 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 sorry, Jeremy, but one other thing Zach raised, and that was the whole notion of reaction. Uh, you're in Regina right now where the actual announcement isn't happening, but what's happening in Regina, I expect every place else is there's a lot of scuttle about who the replacement might be. And I think that's uh, where a good place to start for you. Can you tear the names as to who is likely, who you're hearing, who uh, you're just hearing names about and who is probably unlikely in terms of, of what you've heard so far, Jeremy? Sure. Yes, there's a lot of scuttle, like you said, and we're all trying to find out uh, who's going to be stepping up to run here. The most obvious, I think, right now is uh, Betty Nippy Albright up in Saskatoon Center. Which is a little uh, surprising. A, lot of people, yeah. a little surprising, but a lot of people have mentioned her name, um, and they have even said she's been campaigning for some time, just maybe not as publicly as we think. What's interesting, and it's kind of a sidebar thing, but uh, it relates to her, is the FSIN tweeted this morning that they would endorse Betty Nippy Albright uh, for running for the leadership position. FSIN took that tweet down. Uh, they say they jumped the gun on putting the tweet up, and they will support her when that announcement does come. They were actually expecting it later this afternoon, but we did not, uh, we had not heard that an announcement is coming this afternoon. Uh, so they plan to put that tweet back up. Uh, when she does make that announcement. So uh, she seems like a for sure bet right now. Um, Be like you, Punks, some other... congratulating me on my retirement, right? Yeah. Oh, no, you've got some time <laughs> left, hey? <laughs> Let's start um, another rumor. Other, I, I, spoke to, I spoke to some insiders today, and it looks like it's most, I think we're going to see a bunch of women running from the NDP as leader. I think we, it might all be women that are running. I don't want to fully guarantee that, but a, a lot in Regina. So we have um, Nicole Sauer, who was the interim leader a while back. And a lot of people said, you know, she's done a really good job of that position of leading the NDP during that time. And so they would like to see her back there running the ship. We've also heard Alina's young, Alina Young's name thrown out there. She's a business, a small business owner here in Regina. And a lot of people say her first term as MLA has gone really well. And she could take this party forward, um, especially with her small business roots. And, um, and in that sense, other names I'll mention, uh, there's always Trent Watherspoon, but uh, he's run in the past. There's kind of a, a feeling there he might not run again just because he's already tried. Um, but, you know, we, we might see it, not sure. And then some other considerations, Jennifer Bowes, Saskatoon, Vicky Moat, Saskatoon, and Carla Beck actually here in Regina as well. Those ones seem a little less likely, but uh, there have been some thoughts about that. I'm going to mention this name too, uh, Mayor Charlie Clark of Saskatoon. I think this is more of a bigger wish list mm -hmm. uh, that the NDP would like to see maybe put their hat forward. Um, there's also been some division on whether he should put his name forward. There's some in the party that think it's time for a woman to uh, run for the NDP and not have another middle-aged uh, white man run for the party, as we saw with Cam Broughton and uh, Ryan Miley. So um, I've gotten no confirm on Charlie Clark running or not. I have reached out to him, but those are the names I am hearing. No, there's right anything wrong with middle-aged white men. They're speaking on there. But no. <laughs> I, I mean, I mean, we'll get, we'll all get there. We'll all get there. there. Yeah, someday I will too, buddy. Um, the <laughs> what I'm inter interested in in what you're saying right now is that I'm not hearing a lot other than Charlie Clark from outside of uh, caucus right now. Is is that a admission that we are likely to see this as an internal caucus race? And I'm kind of wondering what that might look like when we're going into. Uh, uh, session against a uh, government that loves to needle and loves to poke and, and, and everybody loves to poke 
the other side when they're in the middle of a leadership race in a house. Nobody from outside right now that uh, beyond Charlie Clark that you're really hearing it. And it and yeah, I mean, I'm going to mention this one, but a lot of people I think would really, really like Cadmus Delorme to run for the party leader. I think they would like that. I, I texted Cadmus. He texted me back saying, you know, I'm really happy with my position right now. So I don't think we're going to see him come forward. Um, in terms of getting a leader to this party, it, I think it will be an internal leader in caucus because you're right, session is coming up really quick here and they probably want to get a leader sooner than later. And so having someone come from the outside, uh, like maybe someone more established leaving their current position, that takes a lot more time than just having someone inside your party uh, just step up to the plate and you can have a quick leadership race and have your leader right away and, and move forward. I'm going to return to the Bond villain stroking that cat right there. Zach, what are you hearing from <laughs> Saskatoon? Because uh, quite often what happens in any leadership race in this province, it becomes a Regina Saskatoon thing in terms of support. I don't know if that's necessarily going to be the case in this particular leadership, but uh, I, I've seen that. You're a little closer to the Saskatoon scene than maybe we are. Is there any possibility that Charlie Clark is anything other than as uh, Jaron Wootley put it, just someone on someone's wish list? Sorry about the cat, by the way. This is my, okay. his name is Prince. It's a great cat. This is my Little roommate's cat. cat. Um, and yeah, I just don't want to deny him attention. He's he's really insisting on it. I think the question about whether Charlie Clark throws his name in the hat is a very real and active one. Charlie Clark has roots in the end, has ties to the NDP. He has an activist kind of background, and I think an important thing to note is that Charlie Clark is a left of center mayor in a conservative province who has been broadly successful as, as a politician. He's won two consecutive terms. He won quite decisively, I would argue, in the last election. Um, and interestingly enough, even some of the even some of the more kind of ardent critics of Charlie Clark, I think, have acknowledged that he's, he's done a reasonably good job on a, on a number of files. So I think he has a lot of credentials uh, to bring to a potential race. The question, I think, becomes, does he help broaden appeal beyond the cities, which is one of the NDP's major problems, right? Like this is something that came yeah. up at Miley's announcement is, how is the next leader going to broaden your party's appeal? The NDP is competitive in many ridings in Saskatoon and Regina. Those are their traditional strongholds, as well as, you know, at least in the past, the North. Um, but you need to get beyond that if you want to win Saskatchewan, if you want to become the premier. So I think it's a valid question, too, to ask, you know, can we find a party leader who helps us advance in the cities, but also maybe helps us make some breakthroughs in those more rural areas or some of those smaller centers like Prince Albert and Moose Jaw, smaller relative to Saskatoon and Regina, obviously. Uh, I think there's a, there's a lot of speculation in the air right now as to what, what Charlie Clark is thinking. I don't know. Uh, I think it might depend on who else throws their name into the hat and how competitive they're looking. Do you think any of that factored into what you spoke earlier about Premier Scott Moe and his approach to this news. Now, it, it seems rather obvious that there's a fair bit of animosity between yes. uh, the SAS party and um, the uh, uh, NDP co collectively. One things that these occasions bring a little bit of grace in politics, but sometimes that, it, it's it's tough times right now. It's, it's hard for anybody to be gracious. In the interview that I did with the, uh, Ryan Miley, the, I think it was a little separate to the formal announcement was basically not really indicating that was anything other than animosity. Are we seeing that from the SAS party right now? Do you think it will continue if we are seeing it? Uh, or is this also driven by the other fact that you were talking about earlier and uh, previously in this cast, which is the fact that there seems to be notwithstanding obviously huge troubles in the NDP, problems in the, in the SAS party side too, relating to dealing with these COVID numbers. I think there's mud being flung in every direction and no one is leaving unscathed. You're absolutely correct that there was not a whole lot of grace and, and, and thank yous coming out of Scott Moe today. When we asked him for his reaction and we asked him about that, he, he went as far to say that, you know, Ryan Miley is a principled individual in, in terms of his beliefs. He did not say thank you for your service. He did not thank him for his time as an elected member of, of the legislature. And when we asked Ryan Miley about, you know, Scott Moe, and I, when I asked about their relationship, he basically said he doesn't want to say anything about him as an individual that is, that is hurtful or, or derisive. But he said, look, I don't have a whole ton of respect for Scott Moe. So clearly zero love loss between these two figures. They've very frequently been at loggerheads. They are in many ways, I think, ideologically very opposite. Uh, in terms of the broader kind of subject of division and divisiveness in the two parties, I think that people in both parties are looking at each other and saying, look how divided they are. 
I think people in the SAS party are saying, you know, Ryan Miley is falling on the caucus's sword and the caucus is in disarray. They're going into another leadership race. They're, they're forked, I think, since Lauren Calvert resigned in 2008. Then meanwhile, on the NDP side, Ryan Miley and others are saying, look, as if we look at what happened to Aaron O'Toole with the federal conservatives, if we look at what's happening to Jason Kenney in Alberta, these large kind of coalition right-wing parties are having all kinds of pressures when their right wing becomes kind of louder and starts to move farther right and the center starts to feel disenfranchised. And Ryan Miley believes that uh, the next NDP leader can capitalize on those disenfranchised voters in the center. He called them politically homeless. Um, so yeah, both parties are saying the other one is divided. I think the true test of that comes at the ballot box, right? We're going to find out very, very soon in 2024 exactly how divided these parties are and how it all kind of shakes out. Um, and it will also come in terms of how strong can caucus be? Will the NDP caucus stay united after this leadership race? Will they get behind whoever is the new leader? And will the SAS party caucus stay united as they plot on into the next phase of the COVID-19 pandemic? Questions to look at. Jeremy, what were you hearing in terms of reaction to the names that you're hearing about who would be best to bring the party together? And I make this observation uh, about Nippy Albright in the sense that it would be fantastic to see First Nations people take a more active role in our politics. And, and, and perhaps we saw that actually in the Athabasca uh, by-election. However, I think in certain segments of the province, It'll be a tough sell for her from two standpoints, one of which is she's relative political newcomer, at least in provincial politics, and and certainly uh, uh, doesn't really have uh, have established herself yet. But more to the point, uh, there might be a bit of a visceral reaction among the voters uh, because of uh, the nature of this province. Also, though, there's also there's been a similar visceral reaction to, to people in the in SAS or in the NDP that are seen as too far left or too far in whatever direction. So, mm -hmm. who is a compromise candidate here, or is there one, or is there a sense that there's someone? Are people already plotting as to where these guys uh, uh, and girls, uh, women, stand on the political spectrum? Like, because this is <laughs> this is interesting to me in the sense that. Uh, yeah, it is interesting. And I was really, I asked a few people inside the party, just like, okay, so this, this idea of division, and I've heard this, you have the activist wing of the NDP and you have the more traditional wing. And so they're going to have to try and find a way to bring those two wings together. The thing is, is they weren't really saying much on that front. They were saying, we'll find out, we'll see once the leaders come forward and see what they stand for, that's where you're going to see those two differences. For sure. And and as you mentioned, you know, Betty, uh, she's new and up and coming, um, maybe more on that activist wing. That's that's been my impression. Whereas um, I think people like Alina Young and Nicole Sauer have some activism in them. Um, but we've also seen more of a, a steadiness or I don't want to say steadiness, but more of a traditional sense in, in that way, too. So we might see some of those differences come forward. Um, I will mention too on the division within the SAS party as well as speaking with a political analyst about this. And I guess there is an opportunity there for the NDP he was mentioning uh, to kind of capitalize on those divisions within the SAS party. They were He was saying that if the NDP can gain seats in the next election, SAS party loses seats, but the SAS party is still in government, um, but they're a weaker government, that's when we might just see more um, kind of claws come out in a way and, and more, uh, when voters can have a chance to really see uh, maybe a, a better alternative to the SAS party if they were to gain but a lot more seats. Zach, in the next that election. does still seem to depend on capturing that middle ground that you're talking about because I don't think the Greens or whoever is to the left of the NDP have much of a foothold. Uh, it's still questionable whether uh, the Buffalo Party uh, or uh, anybody else to the right is going to be much of a threat to the SAS party uh, at all. What's happening with that huge bit of middle ground uh, in Saskatchewan that people are talking about and that you were talking about earlier? And how does either party, but particularly the NDP right now, because you're in the hunt for a leader uh, that can perhaps best capture a new direction for the party, what what is required in, in, in to capture that middle ground that you were hearing? 
I think if I knew the answer to that question, I'd be getting paid a whole lot more money. More. Uh, <laughs> but like that's that's true, right? Because I think defining where the political center is is every party's ultimate objective. You try to figure out what is the kind of most palatable, most generally popular platform that we can get most voters on board with. What is going to make people tick? That is the game. And they try to accomplish that through polling and through all kinds of measure taking. The NDP claims they have internal polling that says that they are making gains in Saskatoon, Regina, as, as Jeremy has reported previously. And Ryan Miley believe, fund, believes fundamentally that there's a lot of winning to be done there in terms of picking up those voters who are not impressed with the SAS party right now. Um, Important to remember, in the 2020 general election, the NDP walked out with the same number of seats they walked in with, 13. Not very good. They are outnumbered. And now they have one less. And now they have one less. They are outnumbered, I think, quite literally, like or maybe close to four to one by SAS party M MLAs. That is not a good look. Um, but I think that what, what Ryan Miley's argument was for that basically was, look, that was in October. We had that election in October during a pandemic at a time when governments that were incumbent like incumbent governments were doing extremely well in elections in canada new brunswick huge victory bc huge victory for the bc ndp so the his argument basically is that i think that most recent that recent success was due to the fact that we were in that early pandemic and people were rallying around the flag that could totally be wrong it could be that the sas party is still in a very solid place with those voters um but really, ultimately, I think the next election is really going to be super telling for Saskatchewan. It's going to be about defining, is there that missing political middle that isn't having its needs met? Will one or both parties find a way to kind of uh, appeal to that middle and, and get them on side? That's going to be the game, I think, when you have one party on the right, one party on the left fighting for the middle. It's It's been it's fascinating. It's obviously been a fascinating week and a fascinating development to, in um uh, SAS politics that we just don't often see. Wish we had more time to talk about this, but thank you so much, both uh, J Jeremy and Zach, for uh, their, your contributions this week. And I guess we'll see you guys pretty soon because more is going to be happening pretty quickly. Take care, guys. Thanks, Murray.